In this video, we are going to talk about credible sources. This is becoming more of a hot topic as the world is finding out there is fake news out there. So what is fake news? How do we know if our source is credible? And what can we do about it as a student or anyone trying to write, publish, um, and present information to make sure that our reputation stays solid. So this is a pretty important video, and let's jump right in. Now, with credible sources, a long time ago, schools used to give you a list of credible sources, and they might have included some of these magazines or news articles, Forbes, Fortune, Management Review, Newsweek, Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, and perhaps these are good outlets still, but perhaps they're not. Honestly, when we look at any overall uh, source, such as Forbes or Fortune, we need to look not just at the title of the magazine or the title of the journal or the title of the book, but who is the author and what are they trying to tell us? Are they trying to sway our opinion or are they just presenting the facts? So these could still very well be reliable sources, but I want you to dig a little bit deeper and think about who is the author? Do they have a good reputation? Do they have a good track record? Are they more of an editorial or opinion writer? And we're seeing that more and more in many of these news outlets. So I can't tell you with certainty that these news outlets are reliable. When I use them, which is fairly rarely, I do check the, the writer, the author of the article to figure out myself, to use my own common sense, if this is credible or not. I want to give you um, a little bit of idea about when we look at credible sources, we are looking for facts. Whether it leans one way or the other, that we need to be able to read it and clear through the mud and figure out what are the facts telling us. And I'll show you some examples here in a bit. But when we look at facts, we don't want to read into the framing of the sentences in the article. So I'll show you here where some articles report President Trump's approval rating. And depending on the source, it looks like the, the rating is good or bad. And the numbers are fairly consistent. So it really depends on who the author is and what they're trying to uh, persuade us to believe. We need to be able to see through this and just look at the fact of what is the number. Also look at misinterpretation of the facts. So data is very helpful in trying to figure out if a source is credible because you'll also see that as we're looking at this basically the same numbers um, you'll see that the the wording is a little bit different depending on who the author is but also it appears that some people just don't understand the facts the data itself when you're presented with a survey and the results of the survey sometimes those results can be difficult to interpret so we want to make sure that whoever is interpreting that for us can truly understand the data. It may be better to go to the actual data ourselves and interpret that for ourselves. And then those that add commentary or opinion, I would truly just steer away from any writing that gives us that because as a college student, a scholar, a professional, we want to make sure that we are presenting the facts. And if you have to clear the muddy water from all the extra commentary and opinion, then we aren't sure that that's a credible source to begin with. I want you to look for sources that truly only state the facts without all this added rhetoric. Because to be unbiased, we need to be able to present the facts in such a way that then the reader can come to the decision of is this good or bad? What is it telling me? I don't want the person writing the article to tell me what my opinion is. I want me as the reader to know what is my opinion of this, of this fact. 
I want you to also double check facts. So anytime that we are looking at any sort of source, whether it's credible or not, I want you to look at the fact yourself, dig into it and figure out, did they have enough people in the opinion poll? Did they use good metrics to analyze the data? I found it very interesting. I'm going to use President Trump's approval rating because this is one that we find often um, has fake news. But I found that when they first started talking about this a while back, I questioned myself, is, have I ever been asked about a presidential candidate's approval rating? And up until that point, I had not. So more than 20 years of being an adult, I had never been asked for my own opinion on the approval rating of a president. So I wanted to know a little bit more about this and who are they asking? Because if you think about it, if they're only asking their friends or maybe they're only asking a hundred people, that's not a good enough population sample to give us information about what his true approval rating is. We want to see that there's enough people in the sample that the pool of participants is big enough to make that sort of statement. Okay, so double check the facts. I want you to use critical thinking when you read any article. When you're given any information, you need to be able to think critically. And we will have a separate class entirely devoted to critical thinking, but I want you to be able to start questioning what's being told to you and do the research yourself with credible sources so that you can start to form your own opinion. Also, again, statistics, consider the number of people in the poll to make sure it's generalizable to a larger population. If, even if the, the sample, if we're saying that the United States of America has a, a 50% approval rating of President Trump, but there's only 100 people in the sample, well, there's a lot of people in the United States, so that's not enough people in the sample. And then from a scientific approach, anytime I do research for any topic, you wanna make sure that your sample is disclosed. Was this a random sample? Was it a sample that was convenient? For example, a lot of teachers will sample their students, a convenient sampling, but that's not necessarily the best way to do it, especially if I'm trying to get the opinion of people that have worked for let's say 20 or 30 years because students don't have that experience yet. Okay, so I wanna show you some credible source examples. Now, I'm using the word credible loosely here, but just some credible source examples. So according to Gallup, and this was a study that just came out, they said that his approval rating was 46%. So I wanna show you this article here. Okay, so 46%. Now this is Gallup. Gallup traditionally is pretty credible. They do a lot of research. They have a good reputation. So 46%, they say it remains high. So notice the wording here. Gallup is making a, uh, basically they're stating that this is a high number, 46%. And what I love about Gallup is that they go into a lot of detail. They usually have graphs so they can see where his rating has uh, ebbed and flowed over the years, over the months. And then at the bottom, they have survey methodology section here. So we can see they did a random sample of 1,024 adults ages 18 and over. Uh, they all live in the United States. And then this is information that maybe um, a little bit more complex, but a 95% confidence level. Let's see. Um, so anyway, this looks good to me. Other than it's still a fairly low number. 1,024 adults is not a huge number when we're trying to make a statement to the United States of America that this is President Trump's approval rating. Now, and it's saying that it's a high rating. So what do we know? 
Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Let's move right on into the next one. So Rasmussen says that he has a 50% approval rating, and this is May 2019. So here we have the same time period. Today's date is May 4th. So within four days, it's somewhere between 46 and 50%, which seems like it's close enough. But I want you to take a look at the wording here. So with Rasmussen, um, let's see. This one is stated a little more factually that they did a study and his approval rating, 50% um, of voters approve, 47% disapprove. Don't get hung up with the, well, there's 3% missing. This doesn't total up to 100. Oftentimes in surveys, there's a percentage that maybe they marked unsure, unknown. So that's quite possible. Um, so this is fairly factual in the way that they present it. You notice there's not any wording that's saying this is high or low. Um, it's not saying that he's going to lose the election or that he's um, an obvious winner. I like that they have this chart comparing the two presidents to just show where they're at. Now, if this is true information, which apparently according to their website it is but it's hard to know because everybody on the internet can make their own claim so keep that in mind um, but the the White House apparently uses the Rasmussen report for their own um, for their own information so they believe that this is credible now um, okay so that's Rasmussen Again, I like that it's just presenting the facts. There's really not a, an opinion either way that it's good or bad. Morning consult. Now, this isn't one that you would typically say, yes, it's credible because it doesn't have a name that you probably recognize. They show that it's 85%. So this is a pretty big um, change in the number. And what I found interesting with this is that they surveyed more than 5,000 people, and I find that this website is very interesting. They surveyed more than 5,000 people, so it's more people than the last website that we looked at, the Rasmussen Report, um, and the, or Gallup, rather, the Gallup Report. They only had 1,024. But it's breaking it down by state, so you can hover over different states and you can see who has, you know, different approval ratings, who doesn't. Um, you can also see that they have it broken down by, let's see, here we have the 85%, here we have 77% um, of his nomination, and then you see broken down by age group. So demographics are very important when doing um, research because we wanna see just what the different demographics are, whether it's male and female, um, age groups. In this case, maybe are they Republican or Democrat, that sort of thing. So this is an interesting information. And then you can also see more demographics. So they have plenty of information in here as to um, income, college level, um, gender, and then they go into the methodology. So they surveyed more than 5,000 people, and let's see. So 2 million surveys, this kind of goes back in um, what they've been doing. It adds to their credibility, right, of what what they're presenting here. So what I found interesting was that there are more people in this study and they're saying um, that 85% of GOP primary voters approve of Trump. So I have not heard of Morning Consult, but I like this website. I think it's providing good information. Again, there's not the extra wording that's saying whether this is good or bad. They're not trying to interpret the results for us. They're just presenting the facts. So that's what I really like about this website. Now notice the difference though. 85% here, 50% here, 46% here. They're so different that if we were going to write a paper and we only used one of these facts, 
we may be missing something. So as a writer, I want you to be more cognizant of all the facts and try to include multiple sources either in your writing or at least in your research to verify, does this make sense or not? Now, ABC, their study actually was from January. Um, Langer Research is a lot of research and they posted on ABC. So I want you to take a look at this one. Let's get rid of these. Okay, so here we have the ABC um, saying that his approval is at a, at a historic low. Well, that's interesting because Gallup said that it was high. Um, so again, now we're starting to get into that framing where somebody is interpreting the results for us and they're using their words to give us an opinion, whether it's good or bad. And those types of, of sources, I tend to steer away from. Even if it's, um, maybe they agree with my opinion or they don't agree with my opinion, but as a writer, as a scholar, we wanna make sure that we are presenting unbiased facts. So in this article, we see a lot of wording here. Um, Trump's job approval rating is 37% in this poll. That's down four percentage points from October and a point from his career low. He's got the lowest two-year average approval rating on record for a president in polls back 72 years. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because this isn't what we were reading on the other websites. So now this shows a graph. I want you to be cognizant that anybody can put graphs together. Anybody can throw numbers out there. Anybody can throw words out there. So this is why it's so important to really dig into if your source is credible or not. Okay, so Trump's dropped to a new low of 27% among women, down nine percentage points. Well, I just wonder if, um, you know, if our other source would verify that because we saw that it was broken down by women as well. So I won't go into that in this video, but that's something you could look into. Anyway, I just want you to take a look at all of this. Um, this immigration issue too is another one that would be an interesting one to dig into to find out what the facts are. I've heard things on both sides with this. Anyway, so something to think about here. I'm seeing wording, I'm seeing framing. It's trying to interpret the data to tell me what my opinion is instead of presenting the facts here. Okay, so I'll let you be the deciding factor on that. Next, we're going to dig into this just a few more websites so I can show you. CNN um, says their, his approval rating increased from 51% to 56% in April. So let's look at this. Along with this, I want you to take a look at this other one. So same source, CNN. This one up here would appear to be positively worded that it's increased um, up to 56%. This one here though, says that Biden's approval rating is 51%, Trump's is 44%, and that he will not win in 2020 unless his ratings jump. They're both published in May. So this is where I'm thinking, perhaps someone doesn't understand how to interpret the data, or they're trying to sway our opinion, and neither of these sources may be um, credible because of that. So let's take a look so you can see for yourself. Okay, so CNN published this document here and it shows their approval ratings um, for President Trump over the years, month by month, which is very interesting to see it like this presented. It shows that they, um, it's a study conducted for CNN by telephone this is an independent research company, and it shows that their sample is 1,007 respondents. So again, just not enough people to say that this is the overall opinion of everybody in the United States. So keep that in mind. Um, here we are again, 56% approval rating so far. This is a pretty high one, um, other than the, the one that we saw that was 80-something percent. And we can see his approval 
um, based on different policies, the immigration, uh, foreign affairs, and so on. So they are just presenting facts here. And they show us some comparison, which I think is interesting because it's showing Obama, Bush, and Clinton, which other ones have said that um, he had the lowest of so many presidents. So if his score is 56%, then he's doing okay, it would appear. So again, look at the facts, look at your sources, think for yourself, and I'm looking to see, okay, so here's the methodology section. They reiterate they used 1,007 people. Um, they conducted interviews in English and Spanish. Let's see, 33% said they were Democrats, 26% said they were Republicans, 41% independents. So that's good information because if they did an entire study just on Democrats or just with Republicans, well, that would be questionable too. So they're trying to get a nice, fairly even um, split between the participants here. Okay, and then that's, let's see, they go through each question that they asked and how people responded. So um, do you approve or disapprove of the way he's handling the economy? Let's see. Healthcare policy, immigration, foreign affairs, race relations, uh, promises made. Let's see. Just poking through here to see if it would tell us just one that says um, they approve. All right, well, we'll go on to the next one and take a look at that. So this one by Enten, who's a reporter with CNN. I want you to take a look at this wording. So based on this report, I mean, it looks pretty straightforward, right? They're presenting facts. They're not giving us much verbiage at all as to how to interpret the facts, which I really like. Um, so I think this is a pretty good, pretty good report, it would appear. Now, when we go over here to also CNN, we see this article then written by Harry Enten, who is interpreting those results. And he says, 2020 polls lay out an ominous pattern for Trump. Now, I'm surprised with this because based on what we just looked at, it looked like it was pretty good. Um, he says it's too early to know who's going to win. And he makes some statements down here. Joe Biden, uh, best known and most likely nominee for the Democrats. So it's questionable right now who's even going to run for the Democrats. Um, but then they say this spells out potential disaster for Trump. I'm not sure how you can interpret this based on what we just looked at. So this is a, an example of more of a commentary or an editorial piece within CNN. So that's why we can't just say blanket statement CNN is a credible source or not. And then as we read through this, um, let's see. Trump's approval rating stands only 44%. Now, again, here, this just the word only is framing this, that 44% is not a good thing. Let's see, to win, Trump can't have the election be a referendum, referendum on him if his approval rating is this low. Well, do we know that 44% is low or not? Because we saw the Gallup survey that said it was high. And then... To win, given his current approval rating, Trump needs the voter mindset to be like it was in 2016. So he actually goes in uh, to some detail here, but basically says he will lose. <laughs> so this is a great example of why we need to dig into the research of all of the information provided um, for every, not just the source itself, CNN, but also the authors within the source. Okay, so we're gonna move right along. Blanton says that his approval rating is 43%. Now notice this was from January, so this could be uh, more of why the numbers aren't completely the same. But again, keep in mind that we're using different participant pools too. 
So they're not going to be the same because we don't have the same people answering the same questions. Okay, so we're gonna look at this article from Blanton and okay so ratings after two years okay they have six takeaways so they look at the economy they look at um his job performance so 43 percent right now and they say it was 50 54 percent last year so according to this fox news which traditionally fox news people think is more conservative leans more towards the republican side but they're actually showing that his his scores are down so it's quite interesting that um what we would deem typically as democratic sources like cnn is showing almost the opposite here um that his scores are in the 50s but maybe they're they're still saying that they're low so it's just so hard to tell and that's why i like to make sure that whatever source we're using we can dig into the data for ourselves and make up our own mind so here we're saying 43 percent approve and uh down 10 percent among women which may uh may be similar to what one of our other sources said that the female vote is down okay biggest drop since last january um this is interesting but somebody is interpreting the data for us so i'm looking to see if there's a way to see the data and do we know how many people okay so this is based on a phone interview with a thousand and eight random voters let's see with beacon research and shaw and company research in january so a lot of companies will use these independent researchers to try and say that they're uh, presenting unbiased information. But again, if the source is interpreting it for us, then uh, my question is, is it still unbiased? Because they're not just presenting the facts. Somebody is interpreting this for us. Okay. So I hope that helps you and doesn't confuse you more. What I wanna do now is just at a high level, um, the University of Maryland provided a great, great resource of what is a credible source. So a credible source is unbiased and backed up with evidence. So unbiased meaning nobody's in there telling us what we need to think. They're not trying to sway our opinion um, and it's backed up with evidence. So I don't just want the article to say I used 1,008 participants. I want a link to the data to see it myself. And then sources may include reputable, reputable peer-reviewed scholarly journals. Now that's really my go-to for any type of um, research these days, is to just go to your school website and look up the data yourself so that you can see what's a scholarly peer-reviewed journal article. So we'll do that here in a minute. Newspapers, blogs and wiki they're just not credible so the university of maryland doesn't want us to use that at all now if you're using websites government and military websites are generally credible but we need to be careful if it's a political website because they're going to try to sway our opinion probably and they're not um, unbiased but usa.gov data.gov there's some other websites like the cdc um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics that we could use that give us a ton of data. Okay. University websites, although they're, they're great resources for us as students, I wouldn't consider them credible um, entirely because one, a university is still a business and they're trying to sell students on their services. So they're trying to influence them to come to their school. Now, if you just wanna use their website and the same with a company website, if you just wanna use their website for facts to find out how many students attend there, what their uh, ACT minimum is, what the graduation rate is, that would be fine. Overall, the idea with websites is make sure that you're looking at facts and just be careful with the products and services that they're trying to show you because they're there to sell you something. 
Um, so that is not unbiased. We want to look for sources that present facts from all sides. When we're only presenting the facts and then the source leaves it up to us as the reader to interpret the facts and to form our own opinion, those are the best. We just need to make sure the facts are credible. Okay, and then the University of Maryland recommends to watch out for the filter bubble. And you've probably found this with your own uh, just daily life, actually, that when you open your Facebook account or you open your phone, it seems to know you. <laughs> and it's feeding you information that it thinks you will like. So in doing that, just naturally, that's not giving you unbiased information. And they recommend turning off, disabling your cookies in your, uh, in your computer, in your phone, turning off targeted ads, and removing your search history to try and avoid this filter bubble. So I've seen uh, where people say, oh, I, I do this for work. Let's say I'm, a, I'm an insurance salesman. And all that I see in my social media feed is about insurance sales. Is that what everybody sees? No, it's not. Our search browsers, our internet, um, keywords, SEO, all of these, these things behind the scene, business intelligence, big data, is reading us and trying to predict what we want in the future. And so in doing that, it's automatically going to send you certain information that it thinks you like. Well, from a research perspective, that is not what we want. Okay. Um, another way to look at websites is to see if there's an About Us page. So there was that one website that I thought was pretty good, but I hadn't heard of. If I want to dig a little deeper into that, we can go to the About Us page. One key is to find out who is funding the research. When you look at any type of research, look at who's funding it. If you know that, for example, um, a pharmaceutical company is funding research for a new medicine, um, well, there may be some, some bias with that, right? Because the pharmaceutical company is in business to sell medicine. They're going to possibly give an independent research company money and probably a lot of money to run the, run the surveys for them to look at the, um, the research and, pr and present the data. And sometimes that causes um, a problem, <laughs> an ethical problem, because then the findings of the research is not accurate or it's not accurately presented because somebody's being paid a lot of money to present this to a company that wants to sell the product. So there's automatically this bias that they need to present what the, uh, the person paying for this wants them to present. I hope that makes sense. Also verify the evidence by tracking down the original source. So sometimes we will see an article that says, for example, President Trump's rating is 43%. Well, if they don't tell us where that information came from, then we need to skip that article. But if it gives us a link to the actual data set, then we can go back to that and find out more information, um, look to see how they conducted the survey, conducted the research, and so forth. Okay, when you look online, so by the way, the University of Maryland did an excellent job pr providing that information. Now, just a Google search to say, what is a credible, credible source, popped up this list by EasyBib. EasyBib is a source that we use often, actually, in writing bibliographies or reference pages. Um, so this is fairly academic with their information. And they provided this long list of websites that you could go to to try and get information. Now, the first one makes me question. Why would I use Bing to do research? I'm not sure that I would. That's about like saying uh, use Google. But the others seem to make sense to me. I use EBSCOhost with my university library. Um, Google, Google and Bing are just not great places to start 
with your research because it's going to give you so much information that is just not credible. Now, Google Scholar, on the other hand, is a different option. Google Scholar is typically similar to what you would use with your university's library. Um, JSTOR is a publication, like a journal publication, so it's pretty credible. And then we see others such as uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, which we feel like is pretty credible because it's the government providing uh, research supposedly on almost every single person in the United States, or that's their goal. So instead of seeing surveys on 1,000 people or even 5,000 people, you should see it on millions of people. Okay, so one more example here of why we need to look at credible sources. Just a quick search in your internet browser, and you'll see that every single one of these people on this list has been reported dead. But in fact, they're not, or at least they weren't at the time of the original report. So you just need to use your own common sense um, use your research skills. If you see something like this, you can always check to say, is this person really dead? And usually you'll find other sources that say, no, it's just a hoax. So there's that information. What are our solutions for trying to find credible sources? Well, the main thing is critical thinking. You need to think for yourself. And again, we'll have a separate class devoted entirely to critical thinking. But the main, main idea is look at different sources. Do the research yourself. Look at the data yourself. Use your common sense and think for yourself. Be careful of any sort of source, website, book, um, article, even on the television. Be careful if someone is trying to put words in your own mouth. There are websites available that you can check and see if your source is credible. So Media Bias Fact Checked website and Snoops. Both of these, you can plug in your, your URL and it should come back and tell you if it's factual or not. Um, again, this is relying on somebody else to tell you that it's a good source or not. So I want you to be able to interpret this for yourself, but this is not a bad idea, especially if it's just questionable, um, you could use these. Also, check with your professor or your school or your library to see what they recommend for credible sources. Some may say a blanket statement that Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Fortune, and those that we listed in the very first slide are okay. It really depends on your school. And then check multiple sources. So you saw in our example that when we looked at President Trump's approval rating, by looking at multiple sources, you see a lot of different numbers, a lot of different interpretations. And so I want you to do that with your research as well. Look at different sources. Okay, now we talked about using our school libraries. So quickly, I wanna show you how to do this. Go to your school website and you can look for the library. Hopefully you have their link. If not, maybe you can actually Google it, what the library website is for your school. And then you can um, type in whatever it is that you wanna type in that you're looking for. And what I love about the school libraries is that it's using lots of different sources. Um, if we look at the library catalog, it will show you, let's see. Actually, that wasn't what I was looking for. If we look at the library catalog, it's gonna show you books, book chapters, eBooks, dissertations, journal articles, uh, papers, publications, um, videos, web resources. It'll show you all sorts of sources and it's not just limiting it to to one type. Now for our purpose, I always look at the scholarly and peer review because in this, by it being scholarly, this means that the person, one has some ethical background that they've um, promised to adhere to. 
All scholarly researchers have to do this before they conduct any sort of research and it's peer reviewed. So not only does the person write the article and promise that they did a good job doing the research, but now they hand it off to a second person who reviews the information and they vouch for them to say, yes, this is a good article. This is a credible source. So scholarly and peer reviewed is my go-to for any type of research. I also just click on full text online that weeds out the stuff that we can't see. Um, and then we can start to see, okay, here's a journal, co journal called the Comparative Political Studies, another journal of politics. We see the Social Science Quarterly. We see, let's see, um, a journal called Problems of Post-Communism and Political Psychology, Latin American Politics and Society. So you can see these are sources that you won't necessarily come up with with just a Google search or a Bing search. And you can go in, read the text online. This pro also provides you with an option for citing your source, which is super helpful. Um, you have to have permission to actually get into your school library usually. And that's because they have to pay for these sources. Um, if you do a Google search, sometimes you can find the article, but once you get so far in, you would have to pay for each article. So this would give you an idea of what a journal article looks like. Depending on the actual journal itself, it's going to look differently but you can download it so you can save it to your desktop if you want and you can cite it. So there's usually a cite button and whatever writing style you're using, it'll give you the option to just cite it directly from here and you can copy and paste that into your paper. Okay, so the other thing that I like about the library at, at the university is you can do advanced searches. So let's say I want to look at presidential approval. I want to look at Trump. Well, and maybe I want to look at, oh, I don't know. Um, actually, maybe we just want to look at it by date. So because we've been doing a lot of research based on May 2019, we will just put the dates in here. And again, you notice all the different content types. You can restrict it to a certain discipline if you want, a certain language, um, peer reviewed publications. We already have that selected on the main page, but we could select it here too. If we just want book reviews and dissertations, or you also wanna include articles, um, this is to exclude it. So you can do that because we're mainly looking at journal articles. And let's see, we hit search. So not too much, but again, today's only the fourth. So <laughs> that would be why. If we wanted to expand our search a little bit more, maybe we look at the full year so far. And one reason this there would not be an article within the past three or four days is because of that peer review process. If I wrote an article on May 1st and I sent it to somebody to review, it's going to take them time to look through it and verify that everything is accurate before they publish it. So that does take time. Now, you see we have 75 results though if we expand this to January 1st through May 4th. And this would be credible sources that you can use for your research paper and feel confident that the information is unbiased and presented with valid and reliable data. Okay, now if you have questions about your library, just ask somebody at your school. They can oftentimes give you help and many have classes or a video like this specifically for your school library. Okay, well that is all that I have. I hope you have enjoyed this and I look forward to our next lesson.